Hi everyone, I'm Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yacker. My guest today is Ryan S. Wood. He's a leading authority on the top secret classified Majestic 12 intelligence documents and the 1941 Cape Girardeau, Missouri UFO crash. He has also been a featured guest speaker at the UFO conferences across the world. Ryan first became exposed to UFOs when his father, Dr. Robert M. Wood, was engaged in deciphering the physics of UFOs while managing a research product on anti-gravity for McDonnell Douglas. I'll be talking with Ryan about the expanded and updated second edition of his book, Magic Eyes Only, Earth's Encounters with Extraterrestrial Technology. It is the most authoritative and comprehensive chronicle ever published on the subject of worldwide UFO crashes and subsequent military retrievals from 1897 to the present. Ryan S. Wood, welcome to Paranormal Yacker. Well, thanks so much, Stan. Uh, it's great to be here and share my insights with the audience. Obviously, Ryan, your dad had a big influence in opening your eyes to the world of UFOs, UAPs. However, not all children follow in the footsteps of their parents. You did. What was there a about UFOs, UAPs, alien technologies, and cover-ups by governments and the military that held your interest on those subjects into adulthood? Well, that's a great question. I think the, the short answer is it really didn't until I was 40. You know, I was first exposed to ufology, so to speak, when uh, Stan Friedman came to dinner when I was 15 years old in uh, Newport Beach. And this is when my father was working on an anti-gravity program at McDonnell Douglas. And it was really nothing sort of super secret. He had convinced his management that we need to figure out how UFOs work before Lockheed does. And then they gave him some money to try to figure out how to change the speed of light and interview some uh, experiences or abductees or let's try to do some scientific experiments, measuring magnetic fields and gathering information about UFOs. And so I was sort of exposed to it and been interested a little bit. But then I went off to a typical corporate career at Intel Corporation and then a digital equipment corporation and then some medical imaging and aerospace. And it wasn't until like the late 80s, early 90s that uh, the first sort of more interesting UFO documents started to leak. And that's when um, uh, my dad and I started talking more uh, about it. I was, I guess, 1990, I'd be 35. When Ryan was Majestic 12 created, who created it? What was its intended purpose? And why all the secrecy around it? Well, it was created in... Um, September of 1947 as a top secret research and development intelligence gathering organization by Harry S. Truman, the president at the time, along with the CIA and the Atomic Energy Act was all that that time in the uh, September time frame of 1947. That's when the sort of government got serious about uh, ufology and UFOs, primarily because in the summertime, 47, you know, early July, we had the Roswell crash and crashes. There was multiple crash events that really put motivation behind the people like Vannevar Bush and other people in the research and development organizations to, well, let's have a program about this. Let's really try to uh, understand how to capture these celestial gifts and uh, exploit them. When, Ryan, did the U.S. government first become aware of non-human intelligence? When you say U.S. government, I, I, I would say that in, in 1941, with the Cape Girardeau UFO crash and then the, the, uh, the Battle of L.A. in 1942, this is when 
several crashes happened and the army had it and the navy had parts and it, it came up to the van of our bush and he talked to roosevelt at the time and said we ought to try to figure this all out and start this reverse engineering program sort of during the war and world war ii and roosevelt said hell no go win the war first and then come talk to me and so it was a very pragmatic approach just sort of do the do the right thing and focus on one problem at a time and so that, that's sort of what happened i think that's the early times now you know there's other crashes in 1897 that were interesting and there was the italian 1933 crash and there was some other events but i'm not sure they ever really bubbled into the government military circles what special access programs cover ufo crash retrievals several really that uh, are re interrelated and i'll talk about each one there's Moon Dust, Project Moon. Everybody's heard of, of Blue Book, for example, or Project Grudge. And these are sort of, you know, lights in the sky, interesting cases that um, sort of bird dog uh, lots of different uh, events. And the really interesting ones that maybe crashes or something anomalous get elevated to a higher level of secrecy and get pulled from something like Blue Book or Project Grudge, which is a very similar organization. The ones that are more focused on real crash retrievals and government operations are Project Moondust and to some extent Paperclip and then Majestic 12 or Magic, Top Secret Magic. I'll start with Moondust. Moondust was primarily a project to recover Soviet space junk or anybody's space junk. In that process, they had several anomalous re-entries of material and they became crashed UFOs or some percentage of them. Uh, I would say most of it's probably space junk, but uh, a certain amount, maybe 10%, 20% w was actual crashed ET hardware. And then it got spirited away to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for analysis or other locations for uh, study. And then Project Paperclip, uh, people may have heard of Project Paperclip, which was primarily an effort to extract the brightest minds from Nazi Germany before the Russians got them. And sort of it was a split between the Russians and the U.S. for these various uh, German experts. And it's clear that Germany was at least a decade ahead of the U.S. in space technology and very much ahead in many, many different science fields uh, than the United States. Those scientists were invaluable and put into very important fields in the reverse engineering of alien spacecraft. Those were participants and then top secret magic or, or military assessment of the Joint Intelligence Commission, committee, excuse me. That's what M-A-J-I-C stands for, magic, military assessment of the Joint Intelligence Committee. And that was the program, the mothership, where all the crashes are, are held and managed and uh, studied. They have a combination of, of factors. We have ridicule, um, which was natural and pervasive. You know, people, tinfoil hats, and there's no such thing as flying saucers and, and so forth. The media uh, incredulity um, and the scientific community dismissing it. So that, that's sort of one aspect of keeping it secret. The other is, is more active disinformation that might have uh, played a role. You know, I think of the Robertson panel, for example, where it's basically just a CIA whitewash of the evidence. Or Captain Rupelt and the Blue Book work where all the really good stuff was taken away from him. And he was left with sort of a prosaic, yawning uh, swamp gas stories. And so that was another method where the public is um, sort of deceived. And I suspect that there probably were in the olden days uh, more aggressive uh, murders uh, or silencing or uh, I, I think of uh, the Secretary of Defense uh, Forrestal who was thrown out his window or balcony on the 
I don't know, it was like the 15th floor of Walter Reed Ar Army Hospital. Um, and so he was, um, it, some of the leaked majestic documents say that was necessary and regrettable. So I guess that's how they sort of keep it secret. So that's one way to do it. Would you know, Ryan, when the crash retrieval program started and who authorized them? I would say that it was authorized in earnest by uh, Harry Truman, but maybe th there were some maybe lower level commanders that I think of, um, maybe uh, General Handy or Spatz or other people in the Air Force that were informed, hey, something just fell down in the desert and we got to go get it. And then we'll um, talk to the president later after we figure out what the hell's going on, tell him what he should know, rather than the whole gory detail right at the last minute. But I suspect he was informed pretty soon because it was like July 10th, 11th, 12th or so that the president meets with the senator from New Mexico, Carl Hatch, I believe. Who knows what went on in the conversation, but I suspect that uh, given the cover story in the newspaper articles and all that stuff, the president talked to him about it. To your knowledge, Ryan, have people been injured working on UFO retrievals or perhaps developed a malady of unknown origin, something medical science is unable to explain, let alone cure? Yes, very much so. I mean, this is... Uh, some of the uh, reports in the the interplanetary phenomenon unit uh, report about Roswell, where the uh, Sandia Engineering District technicians were uh, called out to come to the crash site, and they had several dead uh, alien bodies. But you know, they showed up in their best chemical suits of 1947. Uh, but several of them died of profuse bleeding of the nose and mouth a few days later, uh, having come in contact with maybe just airborne material or bodily fluids or what have you. So those people lost their lives. And I'm sure that many other people uh, may have lost their lives in a more um, overt fashion in the recovery process or in the keeping it quiet process, or from just the depression and the anxiety and the shock of being confronted with overwhelming reality of the extraterrestrial presence and beings from another world. One time I talked to a chaplain who wanted to know how you cancel people that have seen ETs. The whole notion of PTSD from this experience is very real. It probably didn't call it that back then, but it is real. Could you, Ryan, do some name dropping and give the names of a few of the people and organizations that have firsthand knowledge of UFOs, UAPs? I'll get there in a second. I was impressed by David Grush's testimony before Congress and his detail in talking to the Inspector General uh, and saying, you know, I've provided him the names of cooperative and uncooperative people and the names of cooperative and uncooperative corporations and provided a lot of detail in a classified uh, SCIF, Special Compartmentalized Information Facility. And several of the congressmen, I think, also received those details in classified settings. Uh, and the names that I suspect were mentioned in, in corporation world, uh, you would think that Lockheed Martin, for example, or uh, the Carlyle Group or an eg and g or the Aerospace Corporation in Pasadena, California, or um, Boeing, potentially. Uh, there's the usual suspects of or Raytheon, or larger aerospace corporations, and then probably lots of boutique, uh, unique expertise in maybe magnetic fields. I'm just speculating here. I don't really know uh, who was involved. I suspect that the corporations and their leadership, the CEO and the board of directors, they probably have no idea or no clue what these 
special groups are doing uh, in their little unique organizations. Several major governments have captured and exploited both extraterrestrial spacecraft and living aliens. Who, Ryan, are these governments? And in what ways did they exploit the extraterrestrial spacecraft and living aliens they retrieved? Well, I have the most confidence in the U.S. government um, based on the uh, the research I've done and the, and the core material and the majestic documents. And, and I'll get to that. Uh, I would say that it's illogical to believe that crashes haven't happened in the Soviet Union and haven't happened in China or in Africa or in other parts of Asia. So it's sort of a global event or phenomenon. But the one that I know the most about is written up in the um, first annual report of, of the Majestic Documents, which people can go to majesticdocuments.com and look at these documents and read them. But there's um, discussions of the samples of blood and tissue that were taken from these extraterrestrial bodies that offer the ability to create wondrous weapons of biological or bacteriological or virological uh, war and that uh, field tests are underway in the U.S. and the U.K. And this was, you know, a 1954 document. So it's clear that they used the ET biology as a potential weapon or at least researching that option. And they offered strong promise of that. Now, I don't know if that's continued on. I don't know if COVID has anything to do with that. I suspect not. But uh, that's an example of the biological exploitation. I might go on to say, from a technological point of view, or the reverse engineering point of view, uh, Colonel Corso mentioned the um, fiber optics and night vision goggles in his book, where he, in the Foreign Technology Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, was exposed to some of those things, or or even in the majestic documents, they have some mentions of uh, gl clear glass fibers with a cladding type wrap around them, which is the key breakthrough in understanding of how fiber optics work today is that they, you have this glass rod and this wrap around it, which would proves the signal to noise ratio of the, the glass fiber. Of course, naturally, everybody wants to work on, on gravity control. I mean, that's the mothership. That's the crime against humanity, is that uh, they figured out gravity control, in my opinion, um, and they're using it not to solve climate change, provide free electricity, or upgrade the standard of living of all of your human being, but for military and technological advantage. One of the most secret enterprises the world has ever seen was the Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit, often referred to by its initials, IPU. Can you, Ryan, tell me about that unit? The Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit was focused on crash retrieval activity. The name sort of says it all. They were part of the Counterintelligence Corps of the Technical and Scientific Branch of G2 intelligence under Stephen J. Chamberlain. I don't know quite how long it operated, but I believe that it started in the 41 crash or 42 crashes in LA and continued on maybe into the early 50s. Now we know this is a, a real organization because we have Freedom of Information Act request responses from the Air Force and from Air Force Office of Special Investigation saying, oh yeah, there really was a unit, but um, there are no records. We forgot who really uh, runs the organization. And um, sorry, um, we don't have anything more to say. The usual cover-up. With the knowledge you possess and contacts you've made over the years, I, I was wondering, Ryan, if you're able to provide a ballpark time frame as to when the big reveal will come and governments and the military will finally tell their citizens the truth about UFOs, UAPs, and alien beings who have and are visiting our planet. 
That's a sixty-four thousand dollar question, as they say. I'm going to be a little more conservative than most people. I'm thinking more like, oh, 2040, 2050, 2060. There's sort of two aspects to think about. When will the ETs say, okay, we're okay coming down and saying hello on the White House lawn uh, or at the, in the Hague or some other world organization? And I suspect that they won't do that until such time as we're no longer fighting each other, we're no longer awash in nuclear weapons, that we've sort of stopped global hunger and began to realize that we're all sentient, important beings, and that uh, it's a fairer, uh, freer, and more just world. And then sort of until that happens, they're not going to show up, in my opinion. Uh, and as for will the government say much uh, or the truth is a, a compendium of of ranges. Like everybody knows that well, we're not alone in the universe. I mean, uh, people get that. And they're they're confident that, oh, yeah, there probably are extraterrestrials and, and so forth. Um, and we know from Grush's testimony that there's crash retrievals now, although now the Pentagon says, no, no, Grush is a liar. There's no such thing. It reminds me of the Roswell crash test dummies report. Will they really explain in detail the, what they really have? No. Uh, I think that they'll they'll do dribs and drabs. It's it, it'll be a, a sort of a way. We went through a lull of nothing, and then we had Grush, and then we're back down into nothing. And maybe we'll have another whistleblower, and maybe we'll have some more leaks or something like that. It'll slowly increase, just the way our exposure on television and in popular uh, movies has dramatically changed in the past. 30, 40 years from being a taboo to can't miss a Saturday night without an alien program. Should viewers of Paranormal Yakker want to buy your book, Magic Eyes Only, Earth's Encounters with Extraterrestrial Technology, how can they do that? It's on Amazon. That's the easiest way to get it go there, along with the AI Ufologist, which is a book that I wrote in record time because I asked the AI that I trained, actually. It was a, a complicated process that I was doing for my business, my day job. But I, I fed it a bunch of data and went through some complicated algorithms. I asked it the simple question of, you know, what's the ET agenda? I was very impressed with the quality of the answer. And so quickly I asked the next question of why do they abduct humans? What are crop circles? What is the role of MJ-12? And why won't the government tell the truth about this? It's a fast, it's a hundred and something pages, 105 pages or so, but it's very succinct. Uh, and it was fun. And that's on Amazon too. But Magic Eyes Only, the second edition, the updated and expanded edition has, the original one had 74 UFO crash retrievals and it was published in uh, 2005. And this one is published in 2024 and has 104 crash retrieval events that are documented in the book. So it's some 500 pages, footnoted, indexed, referenced. I'm not the expert in every one of these crash retrieval cases. Um, I'm leveraging the fine expertise of others to some extent that have um, that have done tremendous work in investigating like the, the Kecksburg UFO crash that Stan Gordon did or the Roswell work that uh, Stan Friedman or Schmidt or Randall have done, or uh, other cases that are in the book. It's a very powerful compendium. Most of the time, you can say if just one of these things is real, you got a whole different ballgame. It's the preponderance of the evidence that drove me to write it originally, is that you can't deny there's so much smoke, there's got to be some fire. Ryan S. Wood, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. It's been a wonderful, out-of-this-world, intergalactic adventure yakking with you. Thank you.
Thank you, Stan. Hi, everyone. This is Stan Mallard of Paranormal Yakker. I hope you enjoyed the interview you just watched. So that you don't miss any upcoming shows, be sure to subscribe to my free YouTube channel. To do that, just press the subscribe button on your screen.